Now for the reduction in likelihood of dying of a cardiovascular event, stroke or otherwise, the more often you do sauna, the better. So if you look at all cause, all cause mortality or death due to cardiovascular events, and you look at sauna use frequencies using the same parameters, 80 to 100 degrees centigrade, one to seven times per week, basically the more often you get into the sauna for 30 minutes across the week, so 30 minutes a day is better than four times a week. Four times a week is better than two times a week, and two times a week is better than one. And the reductions in mortality are really impressive. 27, if you get into the sauna the way I just described, not the two hours a day, but 30 minutes twice a week or three times per week, you reduce the likelihood of dying of a cardiovascular event by 27%. If you do it four or more times per week, you reduce the probability of dying by 50% of a cardiovascular event. And in these studies, they rule out other things that people are doing, smoking. They even ask them, do you live in an apartment? Are you in a happy relationship? Like they evaluate other com potentially confounding variables. Now, for people that don't have access to a sauna, a hot water bath or hot tub is going to be your next best bet. And if you don't have access to that, do like the wrestlers do, which is, you know, put on two sets of uh, sweats and a hoodie and a, and a stocking cap and wrap yourself in plastics underneath all that and go for a run. But don't, please, nobody die of hyperthermia. I mean, you can die of warming up too much. Is this experience um, pleasant or stressful in the way... So is it as stressful as an ice bath, for example? Okay, great question. People always ask how cold to make the ice bath or the cold water or the shower. You want it to be uncomfortably cold, meaning you want to feel like I really want to get out, but you can safely stay in. And that's going to vary by person yeah. and experience with it. Experience, yeah. With the sauna, it's the same thing. How hot to make it? Well, don't kill yourself, obviously. Um, be smart. If you're pregnant, you shouldn't be doing this anyway. Um, but it's very clear that what you need is the release of something called dynorphin. We have endorphin, which makes us feel good. It binds to these mu opioid receptors in the body. You have dynorphin, which is the terrible feeling that you get when you're in really hot temperatures. It's also the terrible effect that alcoholics feel when they are in withdrawal. You feel agitated, you wanna get out, it's really unpleasant. It's dynorphin binding to the so-called kappa opioid receptor. Is That's what you're trying to trigger. When you do that, a number of things happen. You set off heat shock proteins that go repair broken proteins and misfolded proteins. It also makes it so that later endorphin binds its receptor more strongly. So when you have this uncomfortable experience in the heat, you literally feel better in real life when pleasurable events come on, uh, when you experience them. In the same way, I like to say this, that when you get into a cold ice bath or cold shower, the increase in epinephrine and dopamine is two to 300%. These are huge increases and they last many hours. This is shown because uh, lately I've been getting a little bit of pushback on Twitter that, which is, you know, um, interesting place. Um, people say, well, that's just in mice. No, all the studies I just referred to are all done in humans, men and women, fairly broad age ranges. So you want to be uncomfortable in the cold. You want to be uncomfortable in the heat. This is why I'm not a big fan of infrared saunas because they only go up to about 160, 170 degrees. Infrared light and far red light of all kinds has been shown to be beneficial for wound healing, acne, skin, eyes. There are even guys now putting on their testicles because it can increase testosterone and sperm production. Yeah, hormone release. Hormone release. But in terms of the sauna, you want that strong heat stimulus. Getting cold pull you down from the inside. You have to, I mean, there's a reason why the screening process for um, make, you know, seal, seal, they call it seal training, but it's really screening and training involves cold water is because, you know, you, if you're in the heat too long, you'll die or damage tissue in cold. You can do it quite extensively before you die or damage tissue, but it is stressful. I was going to say one thing that, um, I sometimes enjoy seeing these social media posts where people will get into the ice bath. And they'll look really stoic. Like they're really tough. Mm -hmm. Um, but actually that's the wimpy way to go through it. When you get into cold water, if you stay very still, you develop a thermal sheath around you oh, that you're warming yourself. The, the really bold way is to get in and continue to sift your arms and legs, and it ends up feeling miserably colder. And then, there's no sheath. Because you're, you're breaking, up, the, you're breaking up that thermal layer. And then when you get out, you'll notice a lot of people huddle or they'll, they'll put or they'll grab the towel. In general, that's me. I'll get back, I'll get into the sauna. <laughs> But if you really want to stimulate the big increases in metabolism, you stand out there and you dry off with arms extended 
in open air. And as that water evaporates off you, it is really cold, but your body is forced to activate a number of the warming programs related to metabolism.